Welcome again. A model of O2, diatomic oxygen, a gas that occupies 21% of the Earth's atmosphere and is essential for supporting life as we know it. But there's another, less well-known form of oxygen that also plays a significant role in supporting life. That is O3. This particular model does not fully describe the structure of this unique and very important molecule. From spectroscopic evidence, it is known that the structure of ozone is not made up of two oxygen to oxygen single bonds, as this limited molecular model suggests, but in fact, the bond length of an oxygen to oxygen bond in ozone is shown to be 128 picometers. That compared to the O2 bond length, which is stronger. This difference in bond length between O3 and O2 is essential because O3 predominates in a part of the atmosphere known as the stratosphere, forming what we know to be the ozone layer and the certain wavelengths of harmful ultraviolet light travel through space and begin to enter the Earth's atmosphere. It is this molecule, because of its unique structure, that is able to act as a shield, for it has just the right structure to intercept certain harmful wavelengths of UV rays. And when this harmful ultraviolet radiation strikes a molecule like the O3 molecule, it breaks it apart into a single atom of oxygen and O2. But in time, O3 is reformed. And once again, it can repeat the process of shielding the Earth against the incoming ultraviolet rays. It breaks apart, and it reforms. And it is with this ongoing cycle that ozone in the stratosphere shields the Earth from harmful ultraviolet radiation. Following the spectroscopic evidence, we know that this simple model of ozone is inaccurate. And in fact, the true structure of ozone can best be represented as a pair of resonance hybrids with a bond order of 1.5 with the total number of bonding pairs 1, 2, 3 divided by the total bonding positions 1, 2 giving a bond order of 1.5 for ozone as compared to a bond order of 2 for diatomic oxygen so this difference in bond order correlates to the difference in bond length. And the difference in bond length means a difference in bond strength. And the difference in bond strength means that each bond would require a different frequency and wavelength of ultraviolet radiation to break it apart. And ozone has just the right structure to intercept the harmful UV rays that threaten life on Earth. And in so doing, it forms the very important shield that is known as the ozone layer. With this important life-supporting role played by the ozone molecule in shielding the Earth from harmful ultraviolet rays, came under great threat in the 20th century. For as technology advanced, Great inventions like chlorofluorocarbons, refrigerants, and coolants that would make our air conditioners and refrigerators work throughout the 20th century. These great inventions came with an environmental price tag. And the true cost of using CFCs was only made clear toward the latter part of the 20th century. Through the groundbreaking work of Molina and Roland, in explaining a very important mechanism. But even before the work of Molina and Rowland, Crutzen was able to show that oxides of nitrogen, products of microbial degradation, which initially produced dinitrogen oxide, went on to release 
nitrogen dioxide, and nitrogen oxide. What we know today is NOx. Groups have demonstrated that nitrogen oxide, for example, would react with ozone to produce NO2 and O2, and then NO2 would react with a single atom of oxygen to produce nitrogen oxide again and O2, allowing this nitrogen oxide to be regenerated and to continue its depletion or degradation of ozone. In this way, NO was acting as a catalyst in breaking down ozone. And this was the first threat to the ozone layer to be identified in 1970. This was followed by the work of Molina and Rowland in demonstrating how the CFCs posed a threat to the ozone layer, involving a similar mechanism. And these three researchers were rewarded for their groundbreaking work with the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1995. But let's go in closer now and take a more detailed look at the work of Molina and Rowland in explaining the connection between CFCs, polar stratospheric clouds, the darkness of the Antarctic winter, and the depletion of the ozone layer. Let's look here now specifically at how CFCs deplete the ozone layer. Very often in textbooks, the process is kind of short-circuited to show simple CFC like Freon being acted upon by ultraviolet rays to liberate a chlorine-free radical. And it is this very reactive chlorine-free radical which then wreaks havoc upon the ozone layer by stripping O3 of an oxygen atom. This species, ClO, combines with O3 to generate O2 and to reproduce the chlorine-free radical, which is then able to work as a catalyst going back and repeating the process of breaking down more and more ozone molecules. So in effect, what happens is that O3, which has the property of shielding the Earth from UV rays, gets converted into O2. And the presence of the chlorine-free radical in creating the ClO species allows for a lowering of the activation energy and for it to be much more easy for O3 to combine with the free radical of oxygen to produce O2. But the question would arise, if this is how ozone depletion can happen, why didn't ozone depletion occur at other places in the Earth's stratosphere? Why was it that the ozone hole over Antarctica was the place where the most ozone depletion occurred? And to explain this observation, we would need to go beyond the simple explanation. And we would need to consider the role of the polar stratospheric clouds and the long, dark winter that occurs in Antarctica. And it is during this time that other reactions happen that allow this, these very unreactive molecules, like Freon, to release chlorine gas, and for this chlorine gas to remain unreactive because of the dark winter, and upon the first light of spring in the southern hemisphere, just around August, to allow these chlorine atoms to be free in the presence of UV rays into free radicals. And then this is how the free radical of chlorine really begins to enter into this reaction. And to write it like this would be a gross oversimplification of the process. And it would beg the question, why didn't ozone depletion happen all around the planet? And why was it first confined to the coldest part of the planet? And that has to do with the polar stratospheric clouds and the dark Antarctic winter. But that is the subject of another lesson. And you can click on the link below this video to go to a full lesson on the history of ozone depletion and how the depletion of the ozone layer has been managed.